I hate math, but I love money. And last weekend, we witnessed the Silicon Valley Bank take a giant crash and burn. It's the largest bank failure in the U.S. history since 2008 with Washington Mutual. So you might think, why does this matter? It has no effect on me. And I thought the same thing, but I was wrong. So today we're going to ask Jay why this should matter to us. Why should we care? And what is going on? Because it's a lot of technical financial talk that has normally kept me asleep in the past. But now I'm awoke. <laughs> and since finance is rarely discussed outside of business, there's another reason I want to discuss it today. So, Jay, can you please explain what happened with the Silicon Valley Bank? Okay, I'm going to explain this in as simple, explain like I'm five, ready for the public terms as possible. And on top of that, I haven't spent my life in finance and I don't know every nuanced finance term anyways. Okay. Imagine if you went out to the laundromat, do a little wash. While you were there, you saw your banker, super wealthy super trustworthy banker named SVB. And what was your banker doing? They were counting mountains of change in the coin sorter machine, sort of furtively doing it hunched over, sorting all the coins. So you went over and approached them and asked what was up. And they waved you away with some explanation. They said, oh, I'm just getting some funds together, uh, decluttering my junk drawer, and I'm saving up for some ramen. Just wanna just get some noodles. Oh my God, saving for ramen. How would you then feel about your banker? Would you keep your funds with that banker? Is this what you're expecting to see the banker do? No, no, ew, no. This is kind of what happened with SVB. There's a whole bunch of complicated finance behind it, but basically Silicon Valley Bank and, and all banks really make their money by making loans and investments. They take your money, the money that comes in, and they go put it in different places. They move it around. And this is fine. Usually this is what people expect banks to do. They know banks do this and it's always gone well. But Silicon Valley Bank made a lot of their investments in not so stable places or riskier places. And they had a portfolio focused around startups and venture capital. And they invested it into a lot of hold to maturity bonds at one interest rate and then the pandemic happened and the feds raised the interest rates and now there's a whole bunch of hold to maturity bonds on the market for way better interest rates and their initial bonds aren't worth very much anymore. Basically, they had to scrounge for cash, just like in our ramen example. And this behavior caused most of their depositors to want their money back and they wanted to pull out of the bank. And banks aren't usually ready for most of their depositors to pull all of their money out of the bank. And so one thing leads to another, all the bank customers gossip and say, oh, I saw the banker at the laundromat and things are not going so well and you should get out, I'm getting out, everybody should get out and there you have it. Now SVB is screwed. So I just wanna be clear that I understood this, right? So SVB had a bunch of people's money in their bank. They loaned it out to other people and then they screwed up with the interest rate thing, right? The their bonds, investments and loans. Their investments and loans. They loan money Tanked. out and, and nobody's paying them back. Yeah, it's called being underwater. Okay. And so then other the other clients came and tried to take their money out, but they didn't have any money. Yeah, basically. Awful. Wow. Okay. So this this makes sense why they crash and burn because they had no money. Yeah, there's... Like I said, there's more nuances to it, but that's basically the situation. Right. But but I, I want to understand like a five-year-old and I want anyone who's watching that may not really understand finance because I think the people who like are in the finance world aren't watching this because this isn't for them. This is for the, the, the finance dummies like me who love you. It's okay. Me too. <laughs> Who want to understand this? Cause this has been all over the, all over the internet. People are making reaction videos for it. People are talking about it. And I feel like a dummy and feel completely lost, which is why 
I decided to ask you today about it on the podcast. I'm hoping that we can help other people who are maybe in social situations who are just nodding along and smiling and inside going, what the hell? <laughs> like, like I would be. So I appreciate you explaining it like this. Yeah, my pleasure. By the time we're done, hopefully this is the clearest, simplest explanation for the layperson of what happened out there. And um, that laundromat ramen analogy, I think I found it in a, some Reddit thread. I think it gets the no, message No, it makes across. sense. Your banker is fancy and has a fancy car and has money and wearing a suit. And I see if I see my banker at a laundromat and it's scrounging for change to save up for a dollar ramen, we got a problem. Yeah, and that's what SVB was doing when they put out their strategic quarterly report. Mm-hmm. I think March 8th or something. It was basically them scrounging for... For ramen. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So uh, I did research for this to understand so that I could even ask the questions because I was so dumb about it. I couldn't ask any questions past what happened and what does this mean? So in my research, I saw that none of the clients and customers of SVB lost any money. But how is this possible? If they have no money, the bank has no money, and people are trying to take all their money out, how was it possible that the customers didn't lose any money. Yeah, that's a great question and totally reasonable to ask. Thanks. It can seem confusing, Mm -hmm. but there's three main factors at play. One, banks have insurance. So this helps with a decent chunk of people's money. All right. right. The FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation or something. Everyone just calls it the FDIC. Yeah, I know what it is. Insures depositors. Right. All depositors across the country, as far as I know, okay. of any any bank. Right. And it insures each depositor's account up to $250,000. And there's more nuances. Like if you're a depositor with multiple accounts, they can all be insured for $250,000. Or if you're a corporation that's a separate entity that has multiple subsidiaries that they have accounts, they can have $250,000. So, you know, you can work around the system. Right. But it's still not enough for Silicon Valley. Like it's still not enough for huge corporations like Apple or Google or Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's personal fortune and so on and so forth. If they're kept at SVB, mm-hmm. getting 250K back is like, it's a drop in the bucket. I'm worth millions, right. maybe billions. What is, what is this? Okay. So it's not ideal, but it's something. And for most personal accounts, it's enough. Right, right. The second thing is when banks don't have money to pay all the depositors who want their cash, it doesn't mean they can't pay it ever. It just means they can't pay it now. Okay. If you owe your landlord rent Mm -hmm. and you say, I can't pay it now, sorry, the landlord can have a fit and act like the world's ending, Mm -hmm. or he can be like, well, fine, I can wait. Can you pay me in two weeks? And you move some money around or sell some stuff or wait for your invoices to come in and then you can... I got you. You might have some assets that aren't liquid. This is called illiquid assets. And so banks have a lot of assets. Mm -hmm. SVB still had money, but not ready money, not available money. I see. And they were still hurting overall because of their weird risky investments and stuff like that. But they still have some assets. And if they can liquidate those assets and turn them into cash, now they have flowing liquid cash that Mm -hmm. they can flow and distribute to the people who want their money. Okay. So this is the second reason that people can be reimbursed, that people can get their funds. Okay. But even that likely isn't enough. I mean, it's, it's possible, but probably some major, big, large corporations will still get stiffed. Yeah, I think so. If, if they only have a certain amount of money, they don't even have it liquid to hand out. Right. And if these corporations have more than 250K, then they're going to have to eat it yeah, but what, what the bank or the feds can do is distribute all that insurance money, the 250 k mm-hmm. for everybody, and then distribute whatever assets they can liquidate. Mm-hmm. And so more and more people are made whole or happy or give a piece of it to everybody. And so that at least they all get some money. Mm-hmm. First 250 k then they get 500 k then they get a mill, something like that. Gotcha, yeah. After all the assets are liquidated and the bank is able to pay out. Mm-hmm. And then the third thing that can happen is... Other banks can step in and take over the debt. Oh. Banks are basically giant businesses. Okay, I didn't know that. And right. they have bank takeovers and bank purchases and sales. They, they're just like 
normal businesses, super rich money managing businesses. Okay, so if SVB is screwed and say Chase comes in. Exactly. And they purchase the debt. Exactly. And they have the money they can pay the people that they owe still. And then when people that owe them money, Chase gets it, not SVB. Right. Okay. Got you. All right. And then Chase takes all of the depositors Mm -hmm. of SVB Mm -hmm. and now they're Chase depositors or Chase SVB depositors or whatever they want to call it. And so if that happens, usually everybody gets their money back. Right. And like the world doesn't end. It's kind of similar to having a a web server, a computer server, and it's really important and it runs the whole business or the whole household or the whole smart home or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you have a backup or your neighbor has a backup computer that you can use if it's an emergency. Right. Okay. And so they'll take over and they'll take all the load and they'll help all the customers and they'll... Sorry. Aren't I supposed to be like a professional I can't help it. podcast? We can't yes. talk about that. Yes, we can because it's funny. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I said what I said. All right. I, I'm sorry. It was funny. I couldn't help myself. So, all right. I get what you're saying. So then out of those three things, then what happened with SB? Who came in to save them? I'm not sure because this is a, a big deal and it's still unfolding. The FDIC insurance kicked in pretty quick and mm-hmm. most people got access to most of their money this Monday past. And they may have liquidated some of the bank's assets and made provisions that way as well, I think. As far as, you know, another bank stepping in and taking over, I'm not too sure about that. I haven't heard any news about that. Okay. I don't really know the exact details of how they managed sure, to sure, rescue sure. the whole situation, but some provisions were made. Okay, so it doesn't have to be only one of those three. It could be all three? Yeah, co- a combination of them. Okay. Actually, there's probably more than three. I just, those are the three no, main no. ones. Yeah. A, a government bailout, that has happened for banks before. Yeah. I didn't I didn't include that on the list. Yeah. I'm sure there's finance people and economists who can correct me or add even more or something. But right. you mm-hmm. get the point. Yeah. The point okay. is. There's outs, I think. Yeah, there's some outs. And now you know what happened to SVB and you also know how people kind of got access to their money or at least partially. Partially, right. Okay, this is really, really helpful for me to understand this. And so I feel, (laughs) I won't feel as dumb and having to nod along like I understand. Now I I get it. Um, Okay, so in my research, I came across some words. Dodd-Frank Act. Can you explain what this is and what it has to do with SVB taking a dump? Yeah, I just see it as the Bank Overseer Act, the Bank Supervisor Act. Okay. It's the laws or the act or the bill or whatever you want to call it Mm -hmm. that puts all the rules for how banks have to operate. Oh, okay. It's the Bank Regulation Act. So it kind of keeps the bank in check with their money and and what they do for interest rates and, and for loans and stuff. Yeah, all this stuff. Okay. It decides what size banks can operate at, how much capital they have to have on hand. Oh, okay. It runs stress tests on the bank to see if they can handle a bank run, like what happened to SVB. All kinds of stuff. What's a bank run? A bank run is when all the depositors want their money back all at once. Oh, so they're like running from the bank. Okay. Running to the bank. To, well... Yeah, they want they all flood into the, the bank. bank to take their money. Yeah. And then running from the bank. Like they run to it, grab their cash and, and run, run far far away from it. Right. Yeah. Can't blame them. If I had my money in that bank and and this happened, I would be wanting to do the same thing, so. Maybe technically everyone would be okay if people didn't panic and just kept trusting the banker at the laundromat and didn't gossip to all their friends and say everyone pulled their money out. Because doing that is what causes the bank to fail. If they all just chill, the bank wouldn't fail. It would have been fine. Yeah, but who's trusting the banker wearing crappy clothes on the weekend, hoarding money and saving for a dollar ramen? I'm not saying you should. I'm just laying out the reality is a lot of the times the bank run that people engage in actually hurts them and makes sure they won't get their money. Okay. Right. So, so you're saying just again, to be kindergarten clear, when something starts happening and people start doing the bank run and freaking out, this makes it worse. 
This, this. Often, not always. Okay. Sometime if a bank is really, really going to fail, mm -hmm. the best thing you can do is get out there and get your money as fast as possible. Right. But in this case, and in a lot of cases, the bank run itself, the panic itself is what brings down the bank. And it would have been fine if people didn't. Right. Okay, I got you. I'm yeah, This is awesome. You're explaining it to like a child and I love it. It's so helpful for me. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, back to the Dodd-Frank Act. It's just a weird, confusing name for the Bank Supervising Act. And if I wanted to actually help society and the community, I would just rename it the Bank Supervisor Act. Right. Or the Bank Rules Act. Something simple and clear. Right. But, you know, you've got to get your name in the act, I guess. Uh, no offense to Dodd and Frank, but <laughs> you guys you guys hurt the public with that one, man. No one has a clue what that shit is. Yeah. I couldn't barely even say it, let alone know yeah. what it means. It's like five finance people know what that is and everybody else is out of luck. Well, thank you. I read online that SVB could operate with relatively little oversight thanks to its status as a regional bank. It was thus able to get away with holding a ton of government issued mortgage bonds, even while it was losing money on those bonds in the short term, thanks to higher interest rates. So... I have two questions. So my first one is, can you explain why being a, a regional bank matters? Sure. Because in the Dodd-Frank Act, the Bank Rules Act, mm -hmm. different size banks get different privileges. It's kind of like how highways have different rules than side streets. You can get away with some stuff on side streets that you can't on a highway and vice versa. Right. A big mega bank, a national bank, has different rules and regulations than a community bank or a regional bank. Okay. So my second question is, why were they losing money if there was a higher interest rate? Doesn't that mean people are paying more? Yeah, you, you would think that. I mean, that's a good question. It, it does make some kind of sense. But if you understand the finances behind it or the logic behind it, it will become clearer. So I like to use a cookie analogy. Again, this is another one I found on Reddit somewhere. So imagine you're a dude named SVB. And you want to invest in some cookies. You're like, cookies are great. Everyone loves cookies. This is going to be a good investment. So you go to the store or the market and what you see there available to purchase are a bunch of chocolate chip cookies. And those chocolate chip cookies are three chip cookies. They have three chocolate chips in them and there are a dollar. So you're SVB, you want your cookies, you invest, you buy some cookies, but they're three chippers. You buy some three chip cookies yeah. for you know a dollar each. Right. You're happy with your investment. Seems like a good investment. Sure. Shortly after, later, the market changes. And now everyone in the market is, is thrilled. They're buying tons of cookies because why? Because the market is now offering seven chip cookies for a dollar. They crammed way more chocolate goodness in there. Okay. That's an even better deal. It's amazing. Right. But SVB has their hands full of three chip cookies and they already spent all their funds anyways. It's They're invested. They have three chip cookies. That's all there is to it. The market is all buying seven chip cookies. And now some time has gone and SVB needs some quick cash. They're like, you know what? I need to sell my three chip cookies. I need to get some cash for all this product I invested in. And, you know, they go to the market and try to sell their three chip cookies. And they at least want to make their money back. So they want to get a dollar. They were hoping to get profit. Right. But they'll settle for making their money back. Right. So they're like three chip cookie for a dollar, three chip cookie for a dollar, three chip cookie for a dollar. You think anybody in the market buys their cookies? No, why would I buy three chip cookie when there's seven chip cookies for the same price? Right. Okay. So they would either have to offer a heavy discount, right? Heavy discount, like 50 cents a cookie or something. Right. And they would lose tons of money on that. They would take a bath, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Possibly if there's enough seven chip cookies out there, people wouldn't even bother. Like it's just a hassle, man. I don't even want three chip cookies at all. Yeah. For any price. Uh, yeah. Like even for a quarter, I, why? I would rather invest my dollar in a seven and seven chip cookies. Right. And so this is the same as low interest rate bonds versus high interest rate bonds. Those three chip cookies are basically the same as low interest rate bonds. And those seven chip cookies mm -hmm. are basically the same as high interest rate bonds. And so SVB got low interest rate bonds way back when mm -hmm. the market changed. Fed's cranked up the interest rates and now there's a ton of high interest rate bonds available. And so if SVB wants to get their money out to help pay for depositors and stuff, they're going to get killed, right? They're going to they're going to have to sell it for pennies on the dollar. Right. No one no financial institution is going to take those off their hands. No. 
No. Yeah. So I hope that cookie analogy, even though it's not perfect, and I'm sure some finance people or economists will take issue with it. No, but it doesn't matter because you're explaining it for five-year-olds like me who don't, well, I'm not five, but you know what I mean, <laughs> for kindergarten knowledge on this topic. And it made total sense. Now I understand why the high interest rate matters, why they were losing money, even though the interest rate was high. So, okay. Thank you so much. Great. And and whether the cookie analogy was right or wrong or people have issue with it, I thought it was great. And if you like that analogy, leave it in the comments. I'd love to, to know, was this easy for you to understand the way it was for me? And of course, if you have any questions about any of this, please don't hesitate to ask so we can help answer for you. Okay. So finance has not ever been a big topic for me. I have studied it often over the last four years since we've known each other because I want to be able to run my company and make proper investments. And I, I want to know what's going on in the world. So I don't just want to focus on things that are easy for me. I want to understand more difficult things. Though when I do read about finances, I have to read a little and take a break and read a little because this is a little boring for me. Sorry, guys, but it is. Um, but I want to know. So can you explain again, like I'm I'm a kindergartner, why this whole thing with SVB should matter to me, even though I have no dog in the fight? Well, let me ask you, does being able to tap a button and hire an Uber matter to you? Yes. Does being yes. able to click an app and have Postmates send you food or items matter to you? Yes. Does having insurance coverage matter to you? Yeah. Healthcare? Yeah. Schooling, education, tuition? I mean, yeah. Right. These things matter to everyone, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Does having affordable groceries and prices in the store matter to you? Well, yeah. Right. Well, banks are the backbone of the Western economy, the entire economy. And so what affects banks affects all of those things that I just said. And banks are based on faith and trust. In fact, banks used to be called trusts. You would yeah. put your money into a trust. There are still trust funds. SunTrust is a bank I used to uh, bank with a long time ago. There yeah. you go. Banks were founded on trust. People wouldn't just give their money to anyone back in the day, you would have to be the most trustworthy, safe bank vault, safest vault, biggest vault kind of person. Right. Nobody wants to bank with a low integrity, shady scammer. No. You're putting your money somewhere for safekeeping. What's the number one thing you need to see in that institution? Well, that they're not being shady. Yeah. You need to see integrity. Yeah. Integrity. They need to be trustworthy. Yeah. Right. And what you're definitely trusting is that they're not going to go belly up and take all of your precious funds with them. Yeah, true. Okay. So I, I was just going to ask, but what if my money isn't in that bank though? So I'm getting there. Oh, okay. Okay. My bad. My bad. So let's say a hundred years go by and every bank, you know, is rock solid. Mm -hmm. Your bank, your neighbor's bank, your best friend's bank, your son and daughter's bank. Mm -hmm the bank for your business, all these different banks, they're all rock solid. Mm -hmm. And they send money back and forth between each other. It works like clockwork. Everyone knows when they pay for something or send something or receive something, it's all going to be solid. Everything's good. Mm -hmm. And even if there's a hiccup, there's insurance and they just feel very good. And they have a high trust level in banking institutions. Okay. Okay. Now let's say another 50 years go by and two banks fail. How is the overall sentiment of society about banks now? How's the trust level in banking in general? It starts to lower and a little bit. People don't really trust as much. Right. Now, let's say in the next 30 years, six banks fail. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Then that level of trust goes further down. Right. right? And now let's say in the next 10 years, 40 banks fail. Oh, shit. Okay. Now what are people doing with their money? Oh, they're not putting it in banks. Well, where are they putting it? Under their mattress. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so money stops moving and there's no Ubers and there's no instant hiring and paying and sending and receiving. And people are hiding their money under mattresses and they're scared to give it to anyone because if all the banks fail and they're not trustworthy, well, who else am I going to trust with it? Someone less trustworthy than a bank? Ooh. Good Lord. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes people want to trust the credit card less to make online right. You won't even have credit. Credit won't even yeah. exist because yeah. what's it backed by? Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You see? I got you. The banking system is founded on trust for banks. 
And when it first started, banks had to earn that trust. They had to show that they were the most trustworthy bank. Right. Come to the Bank of America, come to the Bank of Montreal, come to the Sun Trust, come to whatever, because we are more trustworthy. We have the best vault. We are the most secure. We'll keep your money the safest. Yeah. Like any business, they had to compete. That's not really the case anymore. Well, this is why, and, and this is just a side note, this is why a lot of banks will offer you money to come open an account. Like, look, trust us so much here. We're going to give you money to come try us out and see how good we are. Yeah. And of course they offer money. What do they have? T tons of. Extra of. Yeah, money. Right. Okay. This makes a lot of sense. But they're not even competing on trust anymore. No. They're just buying customers. Like wh whichever bank throws around the most money incentives, people will join. Right. Because people have stopped caring about trust. Our society has major trust issues with themselves, with their institutions, <laughs> with everybody else, with the journalists, with the media, with the politicians, everything. Yeah. And now it's just a popularity contest. What bank are you with? What bank are you with? Well, this one gave me a free TV. Well, this one bought me a new house. Like, yeah, I got you. Makes total sense. Right. Okay. But so, look what happens when you, all your institutions are untrustworthy. Look what happens when you can't trust that banks will be around tomorrow. Yeah. One person, one major customer pulling out of a bank can start a chain reaction of every other big investor pulling out of that bank, mm. fleeing like rats from a sinking ship. Even if there was nothing wrong with the bank in the first place, people just have no trust. Oh, this looks bad. I'm out. Well, yeah, that's like the place down the street where everyone stands out in line. And because they see other people standing out online. So it doesn't matter what's going on. So if one person is takes money out of the bank or one company, then people, oh, like, maybe something's wrong. Maybe yeah. I'll, I'll go and they, and they start taking their own money. And like you said, it's like a domino effect. So Yeah, it's just herd behavior, right? Herd, herd mentality. Behavior. Thank you. Thank you. But what yeah. you're describing is herd behavior. Okay. Well, that makes total sense. Or, well, or lemming behavior. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I think that lemming thing is a myth. Oh, I don't. I don't know, but yeah. Anyway, this makes sense. So even though I don't have a dog in the fight, I actually do. Oh, it matters a lot. So yeah. Your whole economy and everything that you love every day, everything you take for granted hinges on trust for the banking institutions. This is why the government bails out banks because a bank failing is the start of the end of times. Like the government can't have that. I mean, technically you can, we'll get, we'll get into that. This is a pretty philosophical discussion. It's really interesting, but generally the government feels like they have to bail out banks because they're afraid that it will bring the economy to its knees right. and everything will stop operating. Well, it makes total sense. So even though I said, I don't have a dog in the fight, I meant my money in SVB because I'm not a part of that bank. I have nothing to do with them. However, it has so much more implications for banking in general, for people in general, for life in general. For who do you everyone. bank with? Yeah. Who do you bank with? Uh, BMO. So Bank of Montreal. So let's say Bank of Montreal was an SVB sister bank. They had very close dealings. Okay. What do you think happens to Bank of Montreal's stock? Oh, it plummets. Yeah. yeah. And so when their stock plummets, they lose investors and shareholders and people sell their stuff. They lose assets and discounts. Mm -hmm. They get more restrictions put on them by the feds or FDIC or whoever, mm -hmm. the Dodd-Frank Act. I mean, it's a Canadian bank, but for our purposes. For the example, I got you. Yeah. They get put under close scrutiny because they were a sister bank to SVB or a friend bank or a bank that had dealings often with SVB. Right. Now yeah. what's happening to their financial transactions and records? Getting scrutinized with a fine tooth comb. Yeah. So fine, you don't have your money in SVB, but how do you feel now as a, as a customer of BMO who's sister to SVB? Are you still keeping your funds there? I don't feel very secure. Are you sure you're going to have it ready when you need it? <laughs> right. No. So now there's a secure. bank run. So now there's a bank run on BMO. Or now what's happening, everyone's like, yo, just put your money in crypto. So what if everyone pulls out of banks mm -hmm. and puts it in the crypto? So now what? You hire an Uber with crypto? No, they're not taking it. Only in certain parts of the world. I'm saying, so yeah. now what happens to the economy, the financial institutions? Okay. You see what I'm saying? It like, takes a giant crap is what it takes. Yeah, what it this stuff, this is why okay. people fear bank failures. Now, I, I don't fear anything. Like I can get into this super deeply, but overall, this is why people make a big deal of bank failures because it does matter whether you like it or not. And if you can't see how your little tiny insignificant city life is actually powered all every aspect of it by 
banks and the financial institutions and insurance and economical branches of the government, then you're going to have a rude awakening. Yeah. Well, thank you. This makes sense. Now I feel, even though like I had no idea about any of this stuff before I started reading and talking to you uh, about this, I just felt like this is something that I should know. Not, I mean, one for social media and to like communicate with other people, but also to like really understand. And it seemed important to me, even though I didn't really know why, but it seemed like I really should know this. So thank you for explaining it because I'm really glad. So if you were feeling like me before and, and feeling like, so who cares? You should care because the, the next time you uh, drink too much and you want to catch an Uber, you may not be able to if banks are taking craps all over the place. So uh, thank you for explaining it. So the CEO of SVB, Greg Becker, he sold his shares two weeks before all this happened. Do you think, and I know it's just an opinion because you don't really know. Do you think that means he knew about it? Well, I believe there's some nuance here. Like he started his share selling process two months before in stages Mm -hmm. over time or something like this. I don't think he just dumped them all two weeks before. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure. But what you say is basically true. He got out in very convenient circumstances and timing. Yeah, it doesn't look good for uh, old Greg there. Yeah. And to that, I would just say anyone who's ever run a business, CEO'd a business, Mm -hmm. can know when something's going to go wrong. Like they can always see the signs. Even for natural disasters like a hurricane or something. If I'm in Florida, I know this is coming. Like for sure. Everyone knows. Yes. You, if you set up your business in Florida, you know a hurricane's coming. Yes. If I'm in, I don't know, the Canadian prairies, probably there's no hurricane coming. Right. Or the Rocky Mountains or something. I don't Yeah. I got you. Makes sense. We know in Florida at some point you're gonna get a hurricane regardless of where you live. So eventually they figured it out or they yeah. figure it's gonna happen. On top of that. If your computer conks out and you lose your hard drive, this is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. Nothing runs forever. You know machines work. You know you should have had a backup. Right. You know you should have invested. You had years, years went by. Oh, you know, I probably should get a backup. Years go by. Your friend's like, oh, do you back up your stuff? Nah, yeah, I should get around to it. Come on. You know this is going to happen. And you can see the signs. On top of that, if business has been low lately or you've had to scrounge for change lately, you know there might become a time where you can't pay a payroll or pay your rent or even buy groceries. It's it's there on the horizon. Now, if things have been good and you've had tons of stockpiled cash and you've got tons of savings and you've got tons of assets and your staff are happy, you're like, okay, I don't, I'm not really too concerned about any any stuff right now. Right. But on the other hand, if each year it gets less and less and you have less and less customers, the signs are pretty obvious. Yeah, and and a proper CEO knows what's going on absolutely. in their business. Absolutely. Things can happen, you know, that we can't predict. Things can happen that are surprising. But you can have a good guess. You can have a good ballpark. It's pretty easy to have a gut instinct on this. Right. You know if your business is thriving and growing and blossoming. Mm-hmm. You know if it's tanking and failing and losing. And you know what inevitability is to be prepared for. Okay. So to me, it would be absolutely absurd if a financial CEO of a bank couldn't see the writing on the wall couldn't see the interest rates going up, doesn't know what to do when interest rates go up. Oh, that's never happened in the history of the economy. Come on. If I had a conversation with Greg Becker, I'd be open-minded and it's possible he didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I'd be ready to hear whatever explanations, defenses, or excuses he comes up with. But it just seems ridiculous. Right. So at the time of my last research, he hadn't actually commented on any of this which I find kind of funny if you're the CEO and you're getting your bank just took a crap. You lost all this money. You had to get saved somehow and you're not commenting. Sure. Imagine your business failed. Not that I want you to, but no, no, I I have had enough fail. Yeah. Imagine your business failed. You couldn't pay payroll. You couldn't pay rent. You had to close up shop. Imagine doing all that without making a comment. No, come on. Like I said, absurd. The word is absurd. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. 
Well, thank you for your thoughts on this and explaining and all the pieces from every question are starting to like make more sense and putting together a whole picture for me. So thank you. Okay, so I'm going to move on then. One of the options that you gave for the for the choices that could help SVB with, with this situation was a government bailout. So the government doesn't help people like pay their bills or, or anything. So and you explained why the government does this. Uh, like you, I touched on it. You touched on it. So I, I was kind of hoping you could expand a little bit because if the government doesn't help people who, who need it, like the everyday person who may be struggling, can't buy food and stuff. Why are they helping these rich banks bail them out for this? I, I, and I get the things you touched on and, and how important it is and stuff, but can you elaborate for me, please? Sure. Back in the day when we had kings and queens more more often and peasants and serfs and this kind of thing, if if the duke in charge of the roads and the moats in the city was having trouble, would the king step in and make sure that the roads and the moats were running fine and help out the duke with the king as well? Or would he just be like, screw you, duke. I guess we'll let the moat turn to rot and we'll let the roads fall into disrepair and my whole nation will just suck. No, because he wants the king wants to have the nation nice. The, like Right. So the king will help the duke. So he'll help the duke. Even yeah. if the duke is incompetent, corrupt, squandered all the money, hmm. the king has a choice. Let the duke suffer the consequences and, you know, figure out some magical way to replace the roads and the moat and all this infrastructure and mm -hmm. or make excuses for the duke and, oh, well, and I'll just be a good king and be generous and help him out. And at least my nation is saved. These are the choices right. for the king, yeah? Right. Let yeah. the duke suffer the consequences, even if it means the nation turns to shit. Right. Or suck up the loss and put up with the duke's bullshit and save the nation. At least it stays nice. Well, if, if the king is for his country or nation, then he'll suck it up and help. Well, if the king is for his nation, to me, way more important than keeping a nice quality standard of living is setting an example for dukes everywhere. Okay. That incompetence and corruption and recklessness will not be tolerated. And if you can't run the roads and the moats properly, I will find somebody else. And I will let it go to hell in a handbasket if I have to. Okay. Because I have integrity and I'm a good king and I don't tolerate this kind of bullshit. I, I don't know how it went on underneath my nose, but I'm going to fix it now. Even if it's a giant mess, even if it's a giant cluster. So to me, a good high integrity king would absolutely make sure the duke has consequences and set an example for every other duke in the nation. But most kings, they don't want to hear the complaints from the peasants and they don't want to let the roads and the moat go to hell and they don't want to go through all this hassle. It's a headache. And so because they want to avoid all these headaches and they want to stay looking good to the population, they will suck it up and cover the duke's inadequacies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now every sense. other duke knows they can get away with it too because the king bailed out the duke. But okay. do you understand gotcha. why the king would bail out the duke? Yeah, so he looks good. Yeah, generally it's selfishness. But the king will claim it's for the public good and for the nation and for the good of everyone. And it's just it's just he's doing the right thing when he's doing the opposite of the right thing. The right thing is consequences and set an example and stand for integrity and don't let this bullshit happen under your watch again. Well, yeah, because my answer was cover it and take care of it as long as for the nation. But this makes more sense. But because even you had that instinct yeah yeah to, to like oh i should just make sure everything's well, okay yeah but, but not for myself though for the people right for, for the, the people. actual people yeah but you would but, actually be harming the entire future of your nation yeah okay well this makes sense this makes sense so if the governments didn't or the government didn't bail out the bank and they had to take a crap what would actually happen? So what? So if no, nobody helped them, they didn't have those four options or what, however many options they have. Yeah, there would be a revolution. They just lost everything and all those people lost money. What would be the next steps? Probably a revolution because now the banks learn that they have consequences. Right. And so if a bank fails, a bank fails. Period. That's it. Yeah. And now the population that put their money and trust in banks is like, oh, crap, we can't trust banks anymore. If we have the wrong bank or an untrustworthy bank, we're going to lose all our money. Because if the government doesn't bail out that bank, all their depositors, all their public people who put the money in that bank are screwed. 
they're homeless, they're without a home, they're without jobs or groceries or whatever the hell. And this is why people can't bear to do it. They're like, I can't, I can't do that to all those innocent people. Right. But you're not doing it to the innocent people. The government is not doing it to the innocent people. SVB is. The incompetent, corrupt, reckless bankers are doing it. The government's just letting them get away with it. The and government is basically saying, okay, you can't wipe your bottom, so I'm going to wipe it for you, right. basically. But the consequences, like Greg Becker should have to pay all of those depositors personally for like the rest of his life. I mean, he has millions anyways, mm. but but he should have to like work it off and go find some other job or do something, like go door to door and like find them bread or whatever. Like right. there are consequences. If you take people's money and you throw it away, there should be no bailout. Yeah. That is ridiculous. Where does the money come from? Like, and the government just prints more. Now the inflation's up again and the money's worth less and whatever. None of this helps. The only thing that helps is real, true, honest consequences from a high integrity government or body that shows that banks must be trustworthy. And if not, innocent people will get hurt. It's like negotiating with a, a, a terrorist or a hostage taker. We so negotiate when, with terrorists, right? So. But when you do, when you do whatever they say and uh, make amends, please just don't hurt the innocent people, sir. Then you're you're catering to their whims. But the banks hold the governments hostage. Literally, we can screw up as much as we want with innocent people's money, and you can't let it happen. You have to bail us out, otherwise, innocent people will be hurt. Sounds like a hostage to me. Right. Sounds like a terrorist to me. Yeah. Yeah. Identical situation, but it's condoned. People are all fine with it. And the government's like, okay, great. We'll just bail them out then. No problem. Sorry, sir. Because because why? Because no one can bear for people to get shit on. If I was with SVB, okay, mm -hmm. and I'm an innocent person, I haven't done my research. I just picked whatever bank sounded good, whatever. My friend was with SVB. So I went with SVB and they failed and I lost a fortune. I lost 250K. I lost 500K. I lost a million. Mm -hmm. People think I wouldn't be okay with it, but I've been homeless for two and a half years and I got myself out of it and I would accept it again as part of life and I would be very careful about where I banked next and I would start demanding trustworthy institutions and I'd keep it under a mattress from now on if I had to until I found trustworthy banks and this would make all of the innocent people sharpen up and smarten up and be savvier and watch where they put their money and this would make all the banks smarten up and our whole financial institution would become higher trust and higher integrity and it would go back to the ways when banks had to be trustworthy and prove that they they backed you and backed your funds and they were weren't squandering it and they weren't throwing it away and they had the best vaults and so on it would go back to that yeah and it would also help people like the regular people make other people accountable for their shit yeah because the world doesn't end when you're homeless. Trust me. The world doesn't end when you have to buy ramen or can't eat groceries. You can pick yourself back up and you can start again and you can become amazing from it. You can become a better person from it. But everyone wants to shield and protect people from the terrible consequences of a bank failure. So let's just keep bailing them out and keep bailing them out until our whole country is a bunch of bullshit and our whole economy is a joke. Yeah, but this is what people do on a regular anyway. They want to shield each other and themselves from pain and heartache because they think that's the way to, to live your life. When in fact, that shit, it makes it harder to grow. It makes it harder to change. It makes it harder, your life incredibly harder when you have been shielded from shit your whole life by someone else or yourself and you're lying to yourself. So it's the same shit, just on a bigger scale with the bank. Yeah. And how do you become financially smart? How do you become good at anything? <laughs> practice and you gotta you you get shit on yeah you gotta take point. your lumps exactly yeah. that's the only way you get good and that's why we have a whole population of financially clueless humans and i don't claim to be great at it but i'm ready to take my lumps and people will call me cold or say this is terrible or how dare you or whatever it's controversial and i'm like fine then keep doing it your way i don't care like i'm not here to dictate what you do i'm not telling you how to do it i'm just pointing the two choices there's the super namby pamby cater to the terrorists bail everybody out, have zero consequences for anything, path. Or there's the take personal responsibility, take accountability, let people take their lumps, set an example, and stand for integrity path. And both of these choices have consequences and results. And you think this is the good one. I know everyone thinks this is the good one because it protects everybody. 
but watch what happens in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years to your financial institutions and your whole economy. Watch what happens to the public's financial maturity and awareness. Watch what happens to society when you choose this. Because soon, eventually, things are going to blow up and collapse and everyone will be back to this anyways. So you're just delaying the inevitable and making it worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And now it's going to affect even more people on a bigger level when it gets too extreme. Okay. So these are the two choices of the king or the government or the ruling body, because the government is just a ruling body. And you asked, why don't they help you with your stuff when you make poor financial decisions? Mm -hmm. Well, why does the king help the duke? Oh, and for not himself, to, to make himself look good and to, to make, make easier on him. Yeah. And what's one peasant failing? Nothing. It means nothing. Right. But what's one duke failing? Yeah, it's more. Yeah. It's so more a, so hmm. the king doesn't give a fuck. Ah, so... So in this example, you by the government, like a couple peasants, you know, fall in a ditch and and their carriage gets a wheel take. He could give a crap, but his duke failing, this is a bigger deal because then more scrutiny on him. Yeah, it affects the king personally. It looks bad on him, and the the nation goes to hell, right. and he has to step in and save it. Interesting, but if good a, example, by the way. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But if a serf or a peasant falls on hard times, like it's not even worth notice, it's like a mosquito. Right. Okay. I gotcha. And so basically the, the king and the dukes are in, in it together. They're like co-rulers making sure the nation runs right. smooth. Yeah. But the king and the peasants are not in it together. No, no. So just like the banks and the government, because the bank is how, like you said before, how everything is run behind the scenes, our financial system uh, and how we, we bank online. and yeah. Every blah, political blah, blah, blah. bribe. Every, yeah. So Wire so transfer then, from a bank. So then the bank and the government are together like this. So this makes more sense. And so they could give crap less about the little peons like us. Thank you. This is so helpful. I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe, you could, <laughs> well, maybe you, you could have a chat with the government, some high ups at the government or the bank, and they would explain like, no, it's not that at all. Don't be so cynical. Um, we do care about everyone and so on and so forth. No, that's the party line. We, we care about everybody and we're going to bail them out for you. We're going to save the Duke for you. But this is not the way because like even without finance, the financial stuff, I already know that uh, doing things I've learned from you with my kids and my family, doing the things for them never helps. As a mom, one of the things that we want to do is to is to help our kids and, and to, to guide them. And But there comes a time where we have to let them, they have to walk on their own. We can't hold their hand forever. They have to learn to let go and, hold, and fall and they'll fall over and over and over again. Yeah. And they, so do banks. Yeah. Yeah. So banks need to learn to fall too. But the way the government would have it, no bank in the world would ever fall or ever fail or ever have consequences. Banks are consequence free and they can literally do whatever the fuck they want at any time with anybody's money. No. This is how banks currently operate. It's like when a child is learning to walk and a parent walks each parent on each side with a pillow just in case they fall. The banks are doing, I mean, the government's doing the same thing with yeah. the banks. Happened in 2008. It's happening now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think the government bailed out SVB in this case, but they got bailed out regardless. But the point still stands. Yeah. The point stands. These are the two choices when a right. bank fails. There's the protect everybody from any kind of follow and make sure there's zero consequences for everyone involved bailout way. And there's the nope, personal responsibility, accountability, stand up for what's right and let people take their lumps. Everybody involved, everybody. Yeah. Okay. And this, no one ever wants to do this. So they'll just keep choosing this yeah. every time. But both choices have consequences. Makes sense. Okay, so I have one more question about this. Mm -hmm. So, and again, I know this is just your opinion. Do you think now with this happening, coming to attention to a lot of people who may have never thought about it before, maybe really didn't understand, were too young in 2008 to, to understand or didn't care or whatever, do you think that now that people are going to have a lot less trust in their banking or will it like not matter because, well, their money's safe? Like, 
No one lost any money in the SVB thing. So we're all fine. You tell me. It happened in 2008. Mm -hmm. That was one. Yeah. That happened again in 2023. Mm -hmm. That's two mm -hmm. in a decade and a half. Yeah. You know, when do people start losing trust? Is a third coming? Fourth? Fifth? How many? No. I already know people who are already like flipped the switch all in on crypto. Forget it. I'm done with banks. Yeah. I'm having my sovereign citizen fund over on Nano or over on Hive or over on Ethereum or over on Bitcoin. So do you think that might be an answer for this? Like a, another way for people to avoid even having to deal with trusting the banks and the government, they can go around it to the decentralized uh, crypto? I mean, people want to believe that. All the crypto bros call it a trustless system. Yes, you, don't, do. you don't need trust for crypto. Right. But it's a joke. Way back in caveman times, you had bartering. Mm -hmm. And so you could trade your fire stick for Grog's oxen or <laughs> pelt or something. Right. And that's fine. But even that required trust. Always. Yeah. It's always required trust from the beginning because it's one human exchanging value with another human. And one human exchanging value with another human always has an element of trust. Because what if that pelt was fake? Or what if that fire burned out? Or what if... Grog only promised to deliver it next week and he didn't and you trusted him and now you're out. Right. Right? You got scammed. Right. And then when we have kings and peasants and serfs and dukes, same deal. Oh, don't worry, the king won't tax you. Oh, but the king did tax me. Oh, don't worry, the duke is putting your money to good use. Or the duke wasn't putting your money to good use. Oh, the donations to the church are for the Lord. Uh, the donations were not for the Lord. Then we have the government and democracy and banks. Surely no one's doing anything shady now. No, there's bribes and <laughs> people doing weird shit with your money. And it's not stored where you think it is. And now there's not even money or paper at all. It's just digits on a screen and typos can be made. And you still have to trust. It's always trust. It's always humans trusting other humans. Oh, but with now we have crypto. And that this is finally <laughs> going to change what's been there since the dawn of civilization. Humans trusting humans. Crypto is trustless, guys. You know, actually, we've been in the crypto sphere, sphere a little bit. Yeah, I love crypto. And, and it's funny because they call it that. But the actual thing is with when it comes to that, a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people in that world <laughs> have less trust and demand more proof for trust uh, than in the fiat world where people are, and fiat, for those of you that don't know, means uh, like paper money, like not crypto. So it's just funny that they call it that when they're the complete opposite. <laughs> they're so paranoid and freaked out about everything uh, in the crypto world. Not everyone, like I said, but a, a good, amount, good amount of those people. Yeah, I agree with you. A lot of crypto fans are super big on proof and credibility uh -huh. and super paranoid <laughs> and super worried about yeah. trust. Yeah. And a lot of people in the fiat system trust everything. They yeah. don't care. Mm -hmm. Trust the government. Trust the banks. Yeah. Trust it all. I just do my thing every day. I don't know. Banks can never fail, right? Yeah. Like, like absolutely clueless about credibility yeah. or trust. But either way, it doesn't matter. Because like I said, human value exchange has always, since the dawn of civilization, relied on trust. And it always will. And no system you can come up with is going to eliminate that. That was good. That was, that was really good. Thank you. Well, I trust you and your answers. Uh, so thank you so much for explaining all this to us. Thank you for your time, for explaining like as a child, you, you gave excellent examples. Super well done. I really appreciate you because I trust in you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so my final question. Do you have anything that you would like to share with our audience, your final thoughts? Yeah, you have the power to be more trustworthy of a person. And I'm not saying you're not, but you have the power to be more. And you have the power to demand more trustworthiness and integrity from your institutions and from other people, from businesses, from governments, from banks. And our society currently has major trust issues and it's crippling society. It causes all kinds of problems. You can't trust Amazon reviews. You can't trust the media. You can't trust politicians. You can't trust anything. 
because the people running those things are not trustworthy. The generations we keep raising are less and less trustworthy. They're more and more lazy and entitled, more and more playing the victim and making excuses and trying to get their way. Less and less personal accountability, less and less personal discipline and focus, less and less doing the right thing and maintaining integrity. And if you're a listener or viewer of ours, you're one of the smarter ones. You're one of the brighter ones, and you have the power to change this. You can insist on more trustworthiness and lead by example, but it's not that fun because being trustworthy means taking your lumps. It means taking personal responsibility. It means never weaseling out of everything or blaming other people. It means stepping up and doing the right thing, even if it hurts. And this is, this is rare. And so I'm hopeful that you understand how important this is, and I'm hopeful you understand how it would help your life the lives of those around you, and the lives of your future generations. And I'm hopeful you'll step up and do the right thing. And hopefully, we can have a happier, healthier, more trusting human race. And it starts here with you and me. And that's why our book and this podcast is called Eyes Wide Open. Keep rising.